bum 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 You are now in session with the Comic Book Couples Counseling Podcast. I'm Lisa Gullickson. I'm Brad Gullickson. And each month we evaluate a different iconic romance within the four color realm. But in this episode, we are dishing out the shimmering seaweed and summering the 10,000 voices, give or take 9,998-ish, <laughs> to send our anaforms into the creator corner with author Mark Siegel talking five worlds, book five, the Emerald Gate. Yeah. Boy, this has been a total nut so week, Lisa. It feels almost like a week and a half. We're recording this on Friday night. We're just entering the last stages of the Sundance Film Festival. Lisa and I have been covering it for AIPT Comics and Film School Rejects, and it's been so fun. Maybe also a little stressful. <laughs> I, what I love about Sundance is that it's an immersive experience. Yeah. I feel like I'm back at college. It's yeah. just like you go to class, you know, you laugh, you cry, you take the entire thing in, and then you go back to the computer lab and you write, 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 write. Yeah. And and it's exhilarating, but it is also exhausting. And, you know, uh, a month ago, the plan was to fly out to Park City, Utah, and attend the festival in person like we did in 2020. But then, you know, stuff. <laughs> uh, and it became a virtual experience. And, you know, uh, you know, there, of course, you're like, oh, I was looking forward to a vaca vacation because Lisa and I desperately need a vacation. Uh, and you're like, oh, the virtual experience isn't going to be as good as the in-person experience. But honestly, the, I just haven't found that to be the case. Of course, I want to escape this apartment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but the virtual experience has been a lot of fun. And I actually really appreciate how... It democratizes the festival, right? So many more people can attend the festival, whether as press or buy tickets. Like, I think the single tickets were $20 a pop. So it feels like when you go onto Twitter and you're talking about Sundance, there's a lot more people to engage with. And there's a lot more discussion and debate occurring online. And I'm loving it. I do miss the sense of adventure, like trudging out in the snow and going and waiting in line for 40 minutes. <laughs> but there is something to be said about being able to do the festival on your own time. Mm -hmm. It took us a couple of days, but we did get into a schedule of we write in the morning and then we take in a movie and then we have a little meal and a little discussion and then finish what we're writing and go on to the next movie. We also incorporated walks into our days because when you're at Park City, you're walking miles from theater to theater uh, and, and you know, you're you're trudging up mountains to go to a restaurant or find a grocery store. And so we kind of wanted to keep that spirit alive. And yeah, we ventured out into our neighborhood a little bit and it has been snowing. Yeah, I, I ordered that special just for you. <laughs> Thank you. And then I also, I took your socks, just laid them outside. Because, <laughs> yeah, you know, it's not, it's not Sundance unless uh, your feet are cold and clammy. <laughs> Absolutely. But, you know, I think we found a way to take this writing-cation and turn it into a proper vacation. And I've found it to be a rewarding creative experience. Every time you go into this immersive festival environment, it's impossible not to absorb that cinematic energy and then transform it into your own creative energy. It reminds me of one of the concepts I took away from reading The Artist Way. Oh, yeah. Many years ago is the idea of the artist date mm. that like you can't expect your inner artist to keep putting out good creative work all of the time mm -hmm. when you are not also feeding it mm -hmm. and taking it out to explore other avenues of creativity. Yeah. And we're not the only comic book people mixing it up on Sundance because Wolverine writer Benjamin, Benjamin Percy, Percy yeah. had a film at Sundance that he co-authored called Summering. It's kind of an 
all girls take on Stand My mm-hmm. Me. It's a it's a young people find a body story. Mm-hmm. But I I really thought it was an ode to the kind of stories that transition you into adulthood. Um, there were references to Bridge to Terabithia and Tuck Everlasting, which are two movies that destroyed me as a preteen. <laughs> Ruined Recess. I actually think Summering and, and uh, you know the types of books that that movie was influenced by is a great lead in to the conversation that we're about to have with Mark Siegel, right? Look at you hopping on that segue. Where are you going so fast? Are we not going to talk about the 23 plus movies we watched in the past eight days? Uh, I think if listeners want a detailed rundown of everything we saw at Sundance, they can head on over to our Patreon feed. We'll do a little episode over there. Or you could hop on over to Comic Book Couples Counseling where all the links to our AIPT Comics reviews and Film School Rejects reviews can be found. Uh, But no, it's time to get into this Creator Corner something proper. And we're not going to also talk about the two and a half seasons of uh, Top Chef we also watch. Hey, hey, that's the great (laughs) thing about a virtual festival. We can sneak in some Top Chef. Okay, I'll give you I'll give you your segue back. We can talk about the interview with Mark Siegel, which I'm really excited about. Yeah, it's kind of wild that our conversation with Mark Siegel falls today because eight years ago this week, we held a graphic novel book club discussion of his book, Sailor Twain. And that was such a spirited and memorable debate. Like, I love Sailor Twain. One, it's a crazy gorgeous book. It's this black and white kind of charcoal drawings. Um, It's about this riverboat captain who encounters this mermaid. And then all kinds of strangeness happens. There's influences of um, Edgar Allan Poe, obviously Mark Twain, a little Hemingway, a bunch of Greek mythology. And like I was head over heels with that book. But there was like one person in that graphic novel book club who just was not jiving with that (laughs) book. And we had such a great, great debate with that guy. I won't name him. He knows who he is. (laughs) But like, like when I think... Uh, of our graphic novel book club, which we had running for like seven, eight years. And I mentioned this to Mark until Alan Moore destroyed it with From Hell. But when I think about that epic run of conversations that we had with our graphic novel book club, the Sailor Twain conversation certainly sticks out. Memorable good books take risks. Yes. And some people are going to find that polarizing and they have terrible taste. Yeah, but if you have not read Sailor Twain, you should do that. Absolutely. Uh, especially if you love fantasy elements, if you don't mind getting a little weird. Yeah, I'm like again, like if you think about uh uh Edgar Allan Poe and Mark Twain, like the, yeah. Two yeah. great tastes, taste great together. A little salty, a little sweet, actually Actually, that's more like too salty. But sometimes too <laughs> salty is really good. It's like a salt and vinegar chip. Yeah. And, and Mark Siegel's also done a couple books with his wife, Sienna Cherson Siegel, called To Dance and Tiny Dancer. And then the books we're about to talk right now, the Five Worlds books, he writes those with his brother, Alexis. And I just love creative families, right? Like Brad and Lisa, we're a creative family. We gravitate towards more creative families. The creative process is like such an intimate thing. And what I find so interesting about this interview is that Mark talks about how even though he starts this each project with these literal family members, over the course of the project, these other people that they invite into the process then also become family. And that's a really beautiful thing. Right. So Mark's not the illustrator of Five Worlds. The art team is Xantha Abuma, Bayasun, and Matt Rockefeller. And when, you know, I don't want to, ah, don't spoil the conversation. <laughs> don't spoil the conversation, Brad. We're going to get into it. But, you know, you join a team and you're one thing at the start. But then at the end of it, right, you're an entirely different group. It's like Restaurant Wars on Top Chef. Who you get matched up with determines the entire quality of your menu. Yes, yes, yes. You have to cook with love, you guys. It's that, Lisa, but it's also like any 
fantasy quest story like Five Worlds, like Bone, like Lord of the Rings. When you join the Fellowship, you know, Frodo and Sam, they're friends. They know each other. Uh, Frodo and Gimli, uh, they're less friendly. But by the end of this saga, those relationships have transformed into something that they could not possibly have imagined. And what's beautiful about the Five Worlds creative experience is that is replicated amongst that team. I think that my Top Chef metaphor also worked. I'm not saying it didn't work. I'm not <laughs> saying it didn't work. I was trying to yes and. Yes and. Tell the listeners what these books are about so we can get into this conversation. So the primary focus of this conversation is around the fifth book in the Five World series, which is called The Emerald Gate. And it revolves around a group, Una, Jackson, and Zoo. And they are traveling to this... Um, Oh, it, well, I'll just read you the description. The treacherous world of Grimbo E. And there, Una must light the last beacon to save the five worlds. But first, she has to find it. When Jack saves an old friend, Una is given a clue to the green beacon's location. So, you know, we have to unite humanity. We have to unite sentient life across the universe to save sentient life. The main villain is Stan Moon. He is a stand-in for all kinds of corporate evil that we know in this world that we call Earth. And I was surprised by how much I related to this adventure as a person maybe approaching middle age. And I think one of the things that Lisa and I have talked about a lot lately, and if you go to our best comics of 2021 episode, you can see the proof right there. We have been loving young adult and all ages fiction right now. And we find so much in these comics that we can pull out and apply to our own world. And what I love about this conversation is Mark is willing to go there with us and get a little philosophical and talk beyond plot and process. Those really are our favorite kind of conversations. And I feel like we got to mention that he is the editorial director of First Second Books, yes. which we love, one of our favorite publishers. I think they really understand how vital young adult fiction is. And uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, they've become a publisher that I will purchase anything. Like, I don't even need to read what the comics are about. I will just buy them uh, on like this, uh, like on our podcast, we've covered Bloom. Mm -hmm. We've covered Bubble recently. We've covered Laura Dean Keeps Breaking Up With Me. We've talked about Dragon Hoops a lot. A lot. So good. And that's why I'm really annoyed that I'm not on this conversation. Yeah, I'm so sorry, Lisa. I was working. You were working and you missed out. But don't worry, not to spoil how well this conversation goes, but Mark did promise to come back on with Sienna to talk about Tiny Dancer. And that is a conversation that we will work around your schedule, Lisa. Thank you. As you should. I am the queen. <laughs> I will not forget that. I will not fail you, my queen. Uh, <laughs> but without further ado, let's get into this conversation with Mark. Let's talk about Five Worlds, the Emerald Gate. Mark, thank you so much for joining us at Comic Book Couples Counseling. It's a real pleasure to have you here. My pleasure. You're here to talk about Five Worlds, and it's the conclusion of Five Worlds. And I always wondered what it was like to cross that finish line having been caretaker to these characters for so long. I imagine it's like a mixture of feelings. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, we're recording this literally on the day that this fifth book comes out in the U.S. And and it's been, you know, over seven years and, and it's this this little magical team of five people. There's my brother and me, my brother is Alexis Siegel, and and then the three extraordinary artists who were, weren't even out of art school when we started the project. So, um, you know, Matt and Boya and Xanthi were, were still students at, at Mika. And I was worried, I remember worrying that you know we knew we had about a 1200 page story to tell and it was going to be a while and you know we worried that what if they you know fall off so yeah so so 
you know, seven years later, uh, we didn't lose any members of the team. Quite the contrary, I think everybody bonded in a in a in a deep way over this thing. And even though we didn't really know each other in a personal sense, like we were we were pretty respectful of boundaries and like you know it was like a professional collaboration to begin with. But it it really became a, a profound creative conversation between us, you know, mm. and so they, they definitely have a special place in my heart forever. <laughs> and we're not done because there's, it's not the end of the road for the project. There's other stuff happening Hollywood side now. Right. But, you know, so we're going to be seeing more of each other, I I think, but yeah, it, it's uh, it, it is a mix of feelings. Like when you get to the end of something, of a stage, you know, there is, a, there's a little part of grief. There's a little part of, um, you know, this is not going to be part of my, my daily, my daily practices. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I wonder if you went back in time, those seven years, would there be something you would tell that Mark or even that creative team, that partnership, uh, that you learned at this point that maybe you didn't know going into? Oh, for sure. For sure. For sure. Uh, yeah, for sure. I, I'm a believer in projects that change you. Mm -hmm. So I think if you're, if you're the same person on the other side of a, an art project of any kind, then, you know, maybe you're, you're, you know, treading water <laughs> or, or, you know, not uh, necessarily growing from it. But I think if you throw yourself at a challenge, then you're going to grow. You're going to be in a different place. I feel, you know, Alexis and I definitely, um, when we crossed the line of the third book and the third book really felt like our storytelling leveled up. And it was also the time when we, we really started to see, to see a lot of uh, fan art and even cosplay Mm -hmm. and you know animators making these little mini animations and it was like suddenly it was living in the hearts of other people in a different way and people were kind of like owning it in, in their own creative lives and that that was really special and then we i think we started having a perspective on um uh, on book one you know and we we did know that we were we, we were taking on a, a, a challenge and the challenge for Alexis and me was based on partly seeing my own kids and also the experience of editing graphic novels with for second. And, mm -hmm. um, and I've seen, you know, that graphic novels, you know, there's this weird thing that happens for cartoonists, right? It's like you, you work, like if you're solo or if you're on a team, you might work two, three years on a book. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, you watch someone, you know, tear through it in half an hour right? <laughs> and, and there's this weird kind of inherent contradiction in the medium right right but what i realized when i saw it was actually when my daughter she was like really too young she was like maybe five or six and she got hold of Jin yang's boxers and saints oh yeah duology which is totally not for a six-year-old <laughs> but for some reason something about it was nourishing to her and she proceeded for weeks and weeks to just read through one then through the second and then back through the first and back through the second over and over and over and over and then i saw this on repeat with like with bone with like all their favorite graphic novels like if they stick in their hearts then and this is true i think for a lot of young readers they become like a perennial read and reread. Yeah. I was actually having this conversation with somebody about manga and you know yeah. how so often with manga, I mean, you can tear through a book yeah. really quickly, but yeah. I find that with my friends who love manga, that they do a lot more revisitation than my friends who are Western comics only. Ah, uh, that's interesting. That's interesting. Yeah. Well, it's a different, it's very interesting how, you know, it's a fascinating thing how manga and like European and American kind of comics, broadly speaking, you know, now it, it, you can't really separate them out so easily as you used to. Mm. But, you know, those schools kind of have different ideas about pacing, different ideas about density of storytelling. And we took a challenge. We basically 
Alexis and I challenged each other to, to create a book that would keep revealing new things on the 20th reading. Hmm. So we were kind of by design going for a super dense reading experience where we were tucking in, you know, even in fact, today we got a really lovely note from our, our editor, a uh, terrific editor at Random House called Chelsea Eberly. Um, and she, you know, she, I remember around book three or four, you know, she, she started realizing some of the stuff that was planted in book one, mm. sometimes in the form of like a poster in the street in the background, you know, but it's like, there's tons and tons and tons of stuff like that. And I would say that the first book, you know, we, we were, there was just so much world building that it's mm-hmm. like, it's a steep entry. <laughs> mm-hmm. And what's weird is like, it's, it seems to be a steeper entry for grownups. And, and <laughs> young readers don't seem to have a problem with it because they're, I think they don't mind. Right. Honestly. But, you know, like in Hollywood terms, they talk about, they, they talk about the world building as like laying pipe. <laughs> and we were laying a lot of pipe <laughs> and, and it's not always, um, you know, I feel like by book three, we were able to really focus on the emotional beats of the characters. Mm-hmm. So that, you know, to your question is like, if we could go back, I feel like book one could almost have been two books, mm-hmm. you know, where we could have taken our time in certain things, but I, I'm, I'm okay. I can live with the way it is because I feel like um, it it really does have its fans. Mm. You know, I I think I was one of those adult readers who, when I initially started reading Five Worlds, it like the entryway for me maybe was a little bit more difficult. But I think about when I was a kid, and the first comic I ever got was like uh, Amazing Spider Man two thirty seven or two forty seven, something like that. Okay. And you don't know what's going on when you first right. open that comic, but then you just catch up. And then once you let go and you start reading Five Worlds. You know, the world tells you, the characters tell you, the world tells you what it is, and you fall into that rhythm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I do love, both as a reader and as a creator, I love being dropped into, you know, something somewhat exotic and foreign and kind of figuring it out as I go. You know, like I love that with certain, there's certain prose writers that I feel do that really well um you know so i and ursula k Le Guin is one example but she she's also very good at like what she she talks about you know you you need to grind up the world building to a fine powder yeah Uh, and and i think in our first book we definitely had some clumps in the powder but but it's still i feel like it it rewards you if you kind of go with it uh, that that is my hope anyway. Well, in the fifth book, you know, you have lots of callbacks to the previous book and you have some indications saying like, oh, you know, this is a reference to uh, book four or book three. And yeah. so it does feel like um, not to be too grandiose, but like it feels like you're building uh, a Marvel universe or something along yeah. those lines. Uh, yeah, I mean, it has a, you know, for us, there was like a kind of an organic matrix that we were working from, mm-hmm. which was the, the those five colors, you know, and you mm-hmm. find them in all different cultures that that kind of pentagram of white, red, blue, yellow, green, um, and with different meanings ascribed to the colors. And but we were working from something where, in a sense, we set up uh, a loom for the project, and then it really did take a life on of its own, you know. And when we got to book five the story really was leading us and teaching us and we, and revealing things that we didn't know were in it. Hmm. And that, you know, the other thing is that the, the, the project started really as like the three kids at the time, (laughs) you know, they were kids that just out of art school, they were kind of like guns for hire. Mm -hmm. Right. And we were kind of the, the engine. Mm -hmm. And then once we got into book one, and they, you know, when, when we were doing some of the, the visual development, you know, they were developing, at first we were giving specific guidance of like, okay, here's what the culture, the different cultures in each world 
are like. Um, here's what the architecture is like. Here's what the ecology is like. Here are some of the indications about light and atmosphere and color palettes. So they took all that and then they started generating with us. So I remember the first day Matt sent us these, you know, there were places and ruins because in book one, you see a lot of ruins from the Felid gods, right? The ancient gods that, that once walked the world there. Mm -hmm. And, and then the art was suddenly coming into a dialogue with the writing, you know, and we, and we were, and there were things that appeared through the artists that we incorporated into the story. So it became like a real partnership and a real five-way creation. Yeah. Like you were saying earlier, you, you become fully bonded uh, after seven years and five books yeah. in. Yeah. Lisa and I have been talking a lot about all ages comics and young adult comics yeah. lately. Yeah. I, since the pandemic started, I don't know what it is. And neither of us have kids, but we have just started devouring all ages comics. And I, I think the conclusion we came to was that all ages and young adult books tend to be, well, they all tend to have um, a message, a lesson that is being imparted or hidden within the text. And given where we are right now as a society or where we are in our own personal lives, I think that is something that we find very comforting. We like engaging with philosophy and uh lessons yeah is is that something that you thought about in the creation of five worlds because i mean clearly like i i was pulling some lessons out of this book it, it feels yeah. like you're also doing a lot of teaching in the story as well in a way i mean it's a funny thing um you know i think i i kind of um i believe the the philosophy of brian mcdonald i don't know if you know one of my favorite books on writing is called invisible ink um, I've not read it, but you are not the first person to recommend it to me. Yeah, it was originally Jeannie Yang who put me onto him, and now he's actually doing some projects for First Second. Some there's huh. some, some amazing stuff coming, and um, he, you know, he says like you know basically that the teaching piece of storytelling is only a problem when it's done badly. Hmm. <laughs> you know, as opposed to saying, well, there should be no message that, you know, which some people kind of take that approach. Sure. And I, you know, yeah, I, I don't like it when I feel like suddenly I'm being preached at, or I feel like there's an agenda that's, sure. that's kind of like, it. it's kind of uh, overshadowing the storytelling sometimes like that stuff. I, I hate but yeah, in Five Worlds, you know, we were exploring things and I think sci-fi and sci-fi fantasy, which this, I guess, it kind of falls into sci-fi fantasy, but sci-fi in general, I feel it tends to be a mirror to our times, right? It's like the 50s sci-fi really kind of holds up a, a kind of a reflection to the fears and the the state of the world. Yeah. All building time. to like the twilight zone. Oh, totally. Yeah, totally, totally. The twilight zone. And I think if it's done, if it's real, if it's genuine, then it's going to, you know, so yeah. So we found ourselves, um, like in terms of a, a villain, you know, a villain is kind of an opportunity to have a reflection on evil. Right. And, mm -hmm. and, what is the nature of evil and what does evil do? What does evil look like? How does evil come about? And you can have a shallow cliche version of evil, or you can kind of really ask some more interesting questions, right? Mm -hmm. We tried, we tried to ask some more interesting questions and what was coming out was, you know, more of a reflection of our times than we realized at the time we were writing it. Sure. Um, so yeah, there's things about demagogues and there's things about uh, media manipulation and 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 also the kind of possession uh, that can happen in in a collective sense, you know, and, and things of that order. And also, you know, book two was a really interesting one for us because the villain is is um, becomes the very thing he's fighting. 
mm-hmm. uh, which which is you know a danger in a time where of great polarization, for example. So things like that were coming in, and you know we wanted to make sure, like, okay, it, you can stay in the universe of five worlds and not be popped out of it, and suddenly think like, oh, this is about Trump or something. <laughs> um, <laughs> even though, and for us, in some cases, it meant like okay, let's make it a little less about Trump because that's like a little too on the nose. <laughs> um, but, you know, evil is like if you, I think the beauty of like Gollum and the Ring of Power is that, yeah, it was probably born out of a, a reflection about about Nazis, but it resonates in all different eras Right. There's something about the seduction and the, the way power perverts and kind of yeah. corrupts. <laughs> For uh, me, yeah. Yeah. you know, there was a moment in uh, the fifth book where Una is talking with the gatekeepers and the gatekeepers are yeah. saying, you know, well, she she's basically saying, I don't want to spoil anything, but mm-hmm. there's a moment where she's being told that it's impossible. and yes. You know, I've always been told it's impossible. It was impossible for me to do this in book one. It was impossible for me to do this in book two and book three. And yet here I am. And as somebody who has been struggling lately with self-doubt and all these like negative voices in my own head, like that was like a moment here in this, you know, all ages comic that felt like Uda was speaking to me and not Uh, the gatekeeper. Oh, Oh, you are so warming my heart. Oh, I hope the other teammates hear this. That's great. That's great. Yes, yes. So, okay, so this is an example where I feel like none of us could take credit for for that (laughs) development because something really happened. You know, Una and Jax and Ansu, the way they carry on in book five kind of defied our kind of like our, our fallback plan Interesting for that book. And one of the things that surprised us was the nature of the green world. And if you're talking about a message, like I feel like it's a message that we really discovered in the making of it, which is there's this message running through book five um, of, of like the a new, a new generation that is not any longer going to wait for permission. Yes to do what's right. And for me, you know, that is Greta Thunberg. It's Malala Yousafzai. It's like, and, and many others who are not as famous, you know, or Amanda Gorman, like reading a poem at Biden's inauguration. And it's like, yes, you know, it's all kind of like regular, you know, it's regular political theater and it's fine. And, but then she comes along and does this thing that has like a power to it. It's like, and I feel like that poem changed the atmosphere in America Yeah, for whoever could feel it. Right. Yeah. So it's like those people, that's the power that we found like suddenly book five wanted to go there, you know, and we didn't know it was going to. Yeah. So the whole thing with like, what you mentioned, which I love, and I love the way you talked about it, which is like, you know, basically the fact that it's impossible doesn't have to stop you. Right. Right. You know, like a 13 year old girl sitting on the steps in Sweden and, and striking from school, you know, how could that ever mobilize a global movement? Yeah. And it, and it, and it is doing it. You know, yeah. so it's like that's a. I think there's a truth there that kind of hit us over the head, <laughs> uh, and I love it. I love to me, you know, that was like the project itself taking a life of its own, and and these were some of the magic rewards. Well, the, you know, the, the uh, dedications at the beginning of the book, you know, they, they kick off with like to the young people not waiting for permission to bring long overdue change to our world. You know, I think that is in a lot of ways something that re- is, is uh, it's something you hear 
in every generation, you know, whether like yes, it's my, yes. you know, my parents were supposed to fix the ales of my grandparents. Right. Yeah, and yeah. and I was supposed to fix the ales of my parents. And now my kids are supposed to fix the ales of my world. Yeah. But like, I think like, even though that is something that we repeat, I think it is so important that we collectively look to the young and show them and tell them this is what we did wrong and this is what you can work on. And I think that's also what I pull from all ages books now as a 42 year old man is, yeah. is, is that hope that I lost somewhere in my thirties. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. there's something, I feel like, you know, all ages, every, you know, I think for every, artist for every creator, you know, whatever form you use is a constraint. Mm -hmm. and, and I mean that in the best sense, right? It's like an artist, the last thing an artist wants is like unfettered freedom because it's horrible. You just disperse like beads of mercury or something, mm -hmm. you know, you don't, you, you need a constraint. You need to work inside of a constraint. Like, you know, a musical instrument is a particular constraint, you know, a paintbrush or a Cintiq tablet or whatever is a, is a, another constraint. And the all ages is a particular constraint. Like you, you don't, you can't, you know, go in and have like overtly explicit sex scenes, you know, there's things sure. that are, there's kind of rules to that game, but it's also like this idea that you can speak to pretty much any human and that if it works as in all ages, you know, that that's, that's really pretty cool. You know, that, that a good story should be all ages mm -hmm. and we're used to it. I mean, Pixar has kind of gone that route. Um, and I think sometimes, you know, some, there are stories that that aren't all ages because they really are very specific to a time. Like for you know, in my mind, Sailor Twain is not because there's sex in it. I mean, there is some sex and there's some. It's but what makes it an adult book is the fact that it's it is a midlife crisis story. Right. Right. It's not. It's not necessarily going to resonate f for a twenty one year old reader in the same way that like anyone was past the 37 year mark. Right. going to read it, you know? Well, you know, you mentioned Pixar as kind of being a shepherd for this kind of entertainment, but I also think about first, second books as mm. being like the place I go to for all ages, young adult stories. Now that's not everything that first second does, you know, like I don't know if I necessarily call like bubble a young adult book, but maybe like a, early twenties book or, or, or something yeah, along yeah. those lines. Yeah. No, and we do. I mean, we have, so that's the weird thing is with first second, you know, we like, you're going to see a very big push coming this fall okay. um, and into 23 and 24 with some really, really big adult books. Oh, um, cool. And, you know, but we're also pushing some very big teen and children's, but you know, it's because we have to work with those categories that we're, and they work differently. They are marketed differently. They're, they're reviewed differently. So it's like they're different games as a publisher, but in terms of content, like, especially with comics, I feel like comics blur all those age categories mm -hmm. more than I think most media. Yeah. I mean, I definitely think that's true. Uh, it, it, it's one of the reasons I love comics so much is because the audiences seem so much more willing to jump around, whether that is genre yeah. or age or whatever. Totally. Totally. Yeah. I'm so glad. I mean, it's so, you know, it's great if, for me, if five worlds can, can speak to a 42 year old man and, and like be, and yeah. move you. Right. And, and also, you know, there's like that eight year old that's, got some, you know, really pointed questions about the weather on Toki, <laughs> which happened. Like I get, when I use, when I was doing in-person school visits, you know, we would, especially after book three, book two and three, we started getting like classrooms full of fans, you know, who were mm -hmm. taking apart like any inconsistency or, you know, any contradiction. Mm, love that. Um, 
so you alluded to that even though the the main narrative has wrapped up, there is still a future for Five Worlds and its characters? So, yeah. So it is a complete story. Um, so mm-hmm. And that we were really clear from the start that it was, uh, you know, it is one big arc of a story. So Like Bone, for example. Yeah, yeah. Like Bone is a complete story. And... There are so we we do have some things. There are some there are some potential spinoffs, but then there's also there's some things uh, that we haven't announced yet that are you know in the animation world in the works. Cool. And we're all five invested and involved, and um, and that's really cool. Like I'm, you know, I wish I wish I could make a big announcement. No, 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 that's okay. That's okay. You You know, I I, uh, hopped on over to your Twitter feed. Uh, before getting on the phone with you today and you have like a pinned tweet from a few years ago i think it's like 2019 but you have like this brief animation of oh, five yeah. worlds and it is really stunning to see in motion yeah so that is so it, that started from like some fan animations originally and then we we did these little commissions for there were some really talented young animators who were fans of five worlds. And we, you know, we ended up commissioning them to do like little seven to t- 10 second animations of their favorite characters. And mm-hmm. we have a whole bunch. We have a little YouTube channel and I, I think you'll find most of them on our, on the five worlds team, Instagram. Right, I'll have to go hunt those down. Cause I, I love that. Cool, right? short I mean, some of those are really beautiful. They're like this kind of 2d and, and, you know, our, our kind of, dream for the show is like if you were to have a kind of a star wars meets studio ghibli Mm. you know where there's like the the world hopping exciting you know big space opera yeah um, but there's also this this poetry and this sense of a visionary dreamscape and the softness that uh, Miyazaki brings to his projects. Yeah. And the ability to kind of wander off into like character moments and just yeah. explore yeah. the emotionality behind the scenes. Yeah. So that's what we would, that's definitely what you just said is what we would be doing more of right. if we were to redo book one. Okay. Cool. <laughs> I like it. I will like have it. a shot. You know, if we, in another medium, we can, some of these things can, can work even better you know so all right well uh, i i will cross my fingers for that to happen uh but mark you know we're gonna have links in the show notes for where everyone can find you but just in case they don't read those show notes uh where can they continue this conversation online with you well the uh marksiegelbooks.com is one place um for for first second there's first second books.com uh and uh from there you can get i do uh, have a, a kind of an occasional newsletter. It's like maybe three, four times a year with a bunch of updates from my different lives. And then five worlds is at five worlds team on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And, and that's kind of fed by all of us, you know, here and there. And, and there's conversation to be had there, which Fabulous. I look forward to. Uh, well, thank you so much. Uh, Lisa's going to be so jealous of this conversation. Uh, thank you, Brad. Thank you for having this. Oh, you're quite welcome. Enjoy the rest of your day. Same to you. Thank you, Mark Siegel. That was a great conversation. Yes, Lisa, I am sad that you weren't able to partake in it. But wasn't it cool how into the idea Mark was of delving deeper than the surface level of narrative? You never know how a creator is going to get. And we have had a couple of people who have gotten a little cagey, which is their right. Yeah. But, like, to me, what I find... So interesting is how do you think? Why is this story special to you? What are you trying to teach? What do you want me to take away? Yeah, and how when you start off telling one particular story, how that story changes you as you create it. I'm fascinated by that idea. And this was such an epic undertaking by all these crazy talented 
creators. Um, it's just it's it's humbling to see them cross the finish line. And like, you know, you got to give a big bravo to them for mm. accomplishing such an epic feat that is five worlds. And this conversation does leave me really excited to talk to him and his wife about their creative partnership and their book, Tiny Dancer. Not to brag, they did send us a copy from Simon & Schuster. It is so beautiful. Mm. It's just three colors, white, black, and this beautiful lilac purple. And I love to see another book illustrated by Mark Siegel. Because yes. I think that his art is so special and specific. And the fact that he wrote this book with his wife, his wife's name goes first. <laughs> so, uh, but I know that I'm also going to get to know her better mm -hmm. through this story. Mm -hmm. And it just... It just makes me really excited. Yeah, and I, I really like the paneling that uh, that he's playing with in Tiny Dancer. The book does not look like Sailor Twain. It's clearly the same hand at work, but he's going for something a little bit different. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's going to be a great conversation. I think it would also be like a really good subject, Lisa, not to like plug something that you've got going on in your life, but you are starting like a new young adult column for comicsbookcase.com. Tom, is that true? <laughs> that is true. You heard it here first, you guys, before I've even penned my first <laughs> my first column. But um, Hey YA is going to be um, just my perspective on the direction of YA books. It's going to include reviews and interviews, and there's always going to be a whole bunch of recommendations. And, um, and yeah, and I think that... Sienna Shurston Siegel and Mark Siegel's Tiny Dancer would be the kind of book I might cover yeah. on this column. Thank you for plugging my work, sweetheart. You're welcome. I'm so excited. I'm so proud of you. Like this past week, working together, writing reviews for Sundance, just like cranking it out. The two of us, we, we don't sit at the same table. I just can't write. Well, we don't sit at the same table to crank it out because that would be weird. <laughs> well, I can't write next to you. I, I, mean, just, I, I, I have to be at least one room away <laughs> to have my own thoughts not infected by your thoughts. I you know, I, to be honest, I've really struggled with my writing this week and I think part of it is because I am raising the bar for myself. I always want my writing to be thoughtful and insightful yeah, and but you've been producing a lot more than you have been in the past mm -hmm. and you've been getting a great reception for yeah. for that writing and you've been doing really quality work and i think that your reviews this week have been phenomenal i've thank loved your you. writing thank you but i'm looking forward to going back to my cozy safe place talking about what I love, which is oh, YA books. I see what you're saying is like <laughs> talking, talking about movies is hard. Yeah, it's a little different than writing about comic books. I am a words person and people, they expect you to talk about what a movie looks like. <laughs> and um, what's it, like, because once you watch a movie at, at a festival, it's gone. Yeah. It's just based on what you can remember. And I'll, I, sometimes I'm shocked to remember I didn't see anything. Oh, so when you're writing a review of a graphic novel, you can like turn Go back to, the to the pages. You know how I like to cite my sources. <laughs> I, I, again, I respect that, Lisa, but I, I thought that you did a bang up job Thank you. this week. Uh, you know, as somebody who, uh, is, you know, we've already talked about how we obsess and celebrate creative partnerships mm -hmm. when I think of us doing writing together in this, not the same room, but near each other. Like, it makes me feel like, OK, yeah, we're a creative partnership. We're, we are living the dream. Yeah. I, and I, I'm not exaggerating when I say that I can't believe what a great time we have together. Yeah. I'm really, I'm really lucky. Yeah. I love you. I love you too. Yeah. We don't say I love you enough on the podcast. And I think that's because we say I love you all the time off mic, <laughs> but we got to remember to say I love you on mic as well. Yeah. I love you. I picked yeah. you out of anybody in the whole world. And as the queen, <laughs> I got to pick whoever I wanted of all of the peasants. Yes. That's how it goes. Uh, all right, so that is going to end our first month of Comic Book Couples Counseling in 2022. It's been a slightly strange month. It's not a typical month for Comic Book Couples Counseling. We haven't done any sessions yet, but we're going to fix that next week. We are diving into Saga. Guys, Saga is back. Brian K. Vaughn, Fiona Staples. 
I, feel, I can't talk. Fiona Staples, <laughs> I'm so excited. Uh, issue 55 dropped this week. It's a good reminder that it's time for us to return to Saga. We covered them many moons ago in 2018. We covered the first four volumes of Saga, but then we pressed pause. We now need to get back to volume five. That's going to be next week's episode. And then we're going to do the next, oh, I was going to say four. So we, how is the math going to work out on this? Well, we're going to have to do five trades in four weeks. So We've done it before. Yeah, one of those episodes is going to cover two trades. Probably trades uh, six and seven will be one episode. But next week, it's just trade five good because i i haven't started it yet and some of you regular listeners may be going like brad lisa i thought this week was going to be your interview with scotty young yeah you know sometimes you shoot for the moon well, land amongst the stars well no it's still gonna happen it's still <laughs> gonna happen but we probably shouldn't promise interviews until we've had those interviews and so we had some scheduling conflicts with Scotty and Sundance, and we're going to make it happen. So somewhere in our saga conversation, we'll drop another creator corner with Scotty Young. Hopefully it'll be the week before we do two volumes in a week. <laughs> yeah, give us a little <laughs> that more space. That would be some space. excellent programming. That would be great. Uh, but there you go. Thank you for continuing to hang out with Brad and Lisa on Comic Book Couples Counseling. Hit us up on all our social medias. Oh, no, this isn't a Patreon episode. How do we actually end these regular Creator Corner episodes? Lisa? Oh, no, I didn't cut and paste our outro onto this thing. Well, you better do it now. Here it is. Okay, Brad, you're corporeal. I'm corporeal. <laughs> Bonus points for which episode I uh, cut and paste this from. We both have a passionate hour to kill. How about we end this episode and create a little chaos of our own? Brad, where can our listeners send their words of affirmation to you? Uh, you can find me on all social medias at MouthDork. If you have words of affirmation for our logo, you can send them to Aaron Prescott at A Cool Hand Fluke. And if you have some words of affirmation for our radical banner art and show poster, send them to Karen Charm at Karen underscore X-Men fan. Lisa, where can our listeners send their words of affirmation to you? I am always accepting words of affirmation at Sidewalk Siren on Instagram and Twitter. If you'd like to spend more quality time with us, you can subscribe to us on Podbean, Stitcher, YouTube, Google, and Apple Podcasts. If you'd like to get exclusive, you can join our Patreon, where you'll get more content, including weekly bonus episodes. And a rundown of our Sundance films. Yay! Uh, if you'd like to reach out and touch us electronically, you can email the podcast, cbccpodcast at gmail.com. You can visit our website, comicbookcouplescounseling.com, or follow us on Instagram and Twitter at cbccpodcast. You can give us the gift of five stars on Apple Podcasts. And if you'd like to do an active service... Why not write a review of the show while you're there? Ooh. We are fluent and receptive in all five love languages. It really warms our hearts and helps the pod. So until next time, friends, keep your love tank full. And your psychic rapport open. Doopy doopy. Boop, 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 boop.